Hey folks, welcome back. Eric Scheidel here, the HVAC Service Mentor. Good to see you all again, virtually if nothing else. Today's topic of conversation is going to be a combination of, of basic and advanced. Uh, basic because we're going to be talking about a very common, common problem. And advanced because the reasons behind the problem and understanding those reasons brings us into the uh, fundamental territory of what makes refrigeration happen and why things are the way they are, uh, which is actually some pretty cool stuff. Now, what we're talking about today is how to handle frozen evaporator coils. And I want to kind of start off with a little bit of an anecdote to kind of describe the nature of this situation. As I mentioned, frozen evaporator coils are a common problem. And they happen not only where you are or where I am, but everywhere, all across the country. And there is a lot of kind of mystery and misinformation circulating around surrounding frozen evaporator coils, what causes them, and how to correct the situation. Um, here's a case in point. I knew a technician uh, years ago, and this guy, he was a great tech, really experienced, 10 years of experience as a service technician in the field, working in the commercial environment. Great guy, smart, great technician. And he ran into a situation where he had a frozen coil on a split system. And he noticed that the pressures were low. He didn't like where those pressures were. So he began to add refrigerant until the pressures got to be where he liked them to be, and he left. Well, not too long after that, the system went down again, and it wouldn't restart. It wouldn't turn back on. And I ended up going back out there to identify what the situation was. Unfortunately, it was in the middle of the night, which is why I remember it so well. And um, the unit was supposed to have, I think, about 16 pounds of refrigerant in it. And he had added refrigerant to it. And I called him up on the phone and said, so tell me, uh, you know, what happened out here? What did you find? What did you do? Because what, what I was finding is that the compressor would try to start, but it couldn't turn. It wouldn't spin over. And um, what he told me was that he found it low on refrigerant. And he added refrigerant until the pressures were normal. How much was that? Well, that was about 15 pounds of refrigerant. That's kind of a lot, <laughs> especially for a system that only holds 15 pounds of refrigerant. And um, so I decided that what I would do first is pull all the refrigerant out and see how much was in there. And it was about 32 pounds of refrigerant were in there, um, about double of what it was supposed to be. Yeah, it wasn't low to begin with. And um, what, what, what had happened is that the evaporator coil had frozen up, but it only froze up about halfway and um, it was causing the inadequate cooling and the low pressures and um, adding the refrigerant to it was obviously not the solution and that's a very common thinking process and we're going to go through the error of that thinking process and identify what the correct thinking process should be and how to handle these situations so without further ado let's go ahead and uh, get into this situation oh and by the way that individual who i'm talking about he's not alone <laughs> i mean like i said this is a very common situation and it does have um, a cause and a permanent effect uh, or permanent solution is what i mean to say now one of the things to go along with that little preamble is i hear and have heard for many many years a lot of kind of excuses as to why this happens. And a lot of technicians love to blame the homeowner for it, right? They say, well, you're setting your thermostat too low. And that's a really, really common um, response that I've heard from a lot of technicians with a lot of different backgrounds and experience levels. It's pretty universal. You're setting your thermostat too low. And it doesn't matter what in the heck the setting is. <laughs> uh, 68 degrees, no, that's too low. You can't set it below 71, sorry. It's just not, just not going to happen. Why? Well, that's because that's how air conditioners work around here. If you lived somewhere else, you could do that, but not here. And no matter where that is, that's always the, <laughs> always seems to be the answer, right? Uh, oh, 74. No, you can't have 74. You can't have it below 78. That's not, no, you can't do that. It's not going to work. Now, it's interesting that the temperature setting can be an influencing factor, but it's never, it's never the cause. And here is some proof. Lots of systems out there are set for well below 70, 65. They don't freeze up. 60. 
they don't freeze up. You would think that if that were the cause of it, nobody would be able to set their thermostats lower than whatever the magic number is, and uh, or everybody would have that problem. And it doesn't happen. So there, we're, right away there we know, hmm, there's got to be something more to it than what the customer is setting their thermostat for. And there is. We'll talk about it. First of all, let's describe the problem. Frozen evaporator coil. What in the heck is it? Here we are on our title slide. This is an evaporator coil. Boom. Cased in ice. It is completely frozen over. And this is what we mean by a frozen evaporator coil. The whole thing eventually becomes a giant snowball, literally. And it is completely covered in frost and ice. This ice thickness on this guy is a good inch and a half to two inches thick. Looking, if you imagine this is, of course, this is a cased coil. And when you walk up to this coil, you're just going to see the outside of the case. It's just look totally normal. But here's a couple of little clues that indicate that there's a frozen coil hiding behind the access panel. And here it is. The suction line insulation has a couple of nicks in it. And there's just, you know, just a little hair's breadth of distance between the end of the insulation and the cabinet case. Um, there's a little bit of frost right there. Well, if you see frost there, you know the entire inside of that evaporator coil is completely, completely frozen over. And this is what we mean by a frozen evaporator coil. Where you and I, as technicians, will most likely first observe the symptom of a frozen evaporator coil is on the outdoor unit, on the suction line. You will see here that the suction line service valve is completely covered in ice. And uh, it's just a little snowball right there. If you were to look down through the fan, you would notice the compressor is also completely covered in ice. And for this reason, some technicians make the assumption that this is where the icing problem starts. That it starts in the compressor somehow and then moves along the suction line to overtake the evaporator coil. Well, that is one of the big first myth busters that we're going to talk about today. That's not at all what happens. Where the freezing thing begins is on the evaporator coil itself. The evaporator coil freezes first. And then, as it does so, the length of the suction line begins to fall below freezing temperatures as well. And ultimately, it travels to the suction line service valve and then on to the compressor. So the compressor has frozen last. This process takes time. It takes time for this ice to build up. The reason why this ice builds up is because the surfaces, the metal surfaces of the evaporator coil, of the suction line, of the suction line service valve and of the compressor, these metal surfaces fall below freezing. The temperature of them falls below the freezing temperature. And the freezing point, of course, for review is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Ordinarily, air conditioning systems and all of their components need to operate at temperatures above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. They're not supposed to fall below that. They are not supposed to freeze. So when they do, there's something wrong to cause that. So when the evaporator falls below freezing, it starts to develop a layer of frost on it because the moisture in the air, instead of forming into liquid water, it will freeze into frost. And this frost continues to accumulate as more moist air is attracted to the, as more moist air goes through the uh, evaporator coil fins, that moisture, instead of condensing into liquid, freezes into ice and it just builds up over time. Then, too, the surfaces of the suction service valve falls below freezing, and it attracts moisture from the ambient air that collects this frost, and this builds up over time and just keeps getting bigger and bigger and thicker and thicker and thicker. Same thing with the compressor. The compressor falls below freezing, and it attracts water vapor, which freezes its frost, and it just builds and builds and builds and builds. So one thing we know for certain when we look at this suction line service valve that's a snowball is that this thing has been running and freezing a very 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 long time hours and hours if not days at least a whole solid day if not longer now how long it takes for this size of an ice ball to develop depends mostly on how much relative humidity and how much moisture there is in the atmosphere
The more moist it is, the faster it'll occur. The less moist it is, the longer it takes to occur. But nevertheless, it takes time. It takes a long time. And um, uh, it's because it's below freezing for a long time. So let's take a look and see what happens or what needs to occur in order for this ice to form. In order for an evaporator coil to develop a coating of frost and ice, the saturated suction temperature must fall below freezing. So that is rule number one, condition number one that must be met. So let's review what we mean by saturated suction temperature. Saturated suction temperature refers, let me come back here, there we go. Saturated suction temperature refers to the temperature at which the refrigerant is boiling in the evaporator. It is the boiling point of the refrigerant inside the evaporator. And it's called saturated suction temperature because the saturation temperature of refrigerant is that boiling point, and this is the boiling point of that refrigerant in the suction line as measured in the suction line because that's where we put our gauge on. So saturated suction temperature sounds like a complicated term, but it really just means the boiling point of the refrigerant inside the evaporator. Cool. So let's take a look at these normal saturated suction temperatures. And here they are in red. Normal saturated suction temperatures fall between here they are in red. There we go. Normal saturated suction temperatures fall between 35 and 45 degrees. If our saturated suction temperature falls lower than 35, we're going to get into that close to that 32 degree freezing temperature. And you'll notice that the saturated suction temperatures correspond to saturated suction pressures. This is what our suction pressure would be. For R22, our normal evaporator suction temperature that is going to produce, I'm sorry, our normal evaporator suction pressure that is going to produce temperatures between 35 and 45 falls between about 62 PSI and about 76 PSI, with 70 being the sweet spot. For R410A over here, our normal suction pressures fall somewhere between about 108 up to about 130, with a sweet spot being considered to be right around 120. 119, 119, 120, right in that neighborhood. And that gives us our nice operating 40 degree saturated suction temperature. Notice when we get into these freezing zones down here, the saturated suction pressure also has fallen. And this is the thing that most technicians notice when they run into a system that is freezing or is going to freeze or is frozen, is that the suction pressures are low. Well, as we can see, in order for there to be freezing to occur, the suction pressures have to be low. And they are. So low saturated suction temperatures and low suction pressures go hand in hand. So first thing we need to have is to have the saturated suction temperature fall below freezing. And we also need to have the system be running in such a way that it reduces the superheat to be at or near zero. Low saturated suction temperature is caused by a low suction pressure. And the low suction pressure is what corresponds to the low evaporator temperature. So it's not the other way around. Low temperature doesn't cause low pressure. In this case, low pressure is what's causing the low temperature. And when we're diagnosing this problem, that is the problem that we have to go after. Why is our suction pressure too low? And a lot of technicians will say, well, the reason why the pressure is too low is because there's not enough refrigerant in there. Well, it's, it sounds like a pretty logical thought. However, that's not exactly the way refrigerant works. One of the things that we need to realize that kind of is the smoking gun clue in this situation is that in cases where the suction pressure and the saturated suction temperature is low and there is superheat happening, the temperature of the refrigerant leaving the coil will still be above freezing. Let's check that out for a minute. So let's say, for example, we have our 410A and it is running at a saturated uh, suction pressure of about, let's say, 90 PSI. 
Okay, so 90 psi is about halfway here between 97 and 87, and that's going to give us a temperature of about 28 degrees. 28 degrees is definitely below freezing. Are we going to frost up that coil? Yes, yes we are. There's going to be some potential for frost forming right there. However, if we are working in such a way that we are in fact evaporating all that refrigerant quickly and superheating it in the evaporator, the leaving eva superheated vapor temperature is going to be at least 10 degrees warmer than that. So if we're at 28, then our leaving vapor temperature is going to be 38. That's above freezing. We're not going to freeze the entire coil. In fact, we're probably be going to be doing enough refrigeration that we're going to effectively cool the house or the air and drop the temperature and the unit's going to shut off. And then any frost that may have occurred is going to go away. That is normal in conditions of relatively low load, such as mild outdoor conditions combined with not very high indoor conditions. It's not very challenging to meet the demand for the air conditioner, and therefore it's going to run, it's going to cool. It will run in this sub-freezing zone right here, but it won't run long enough for it to completely freeze over. And that in there is the key. We are having a system that it, A, is running in freezing temperatures, but it's not effectively cooling, therefore it has to keep running. And as it keeps running, frost builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And as the frost builds, the ability for the system to cool and remove heat gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the condition literally snowballs and it becomes an actual literal snowball. That's the key is that we don't just have freezing conditions. We have no superheat and long run times. We are not absorbing heat into the evaporator. That is, in fact, the key. And in order to really understand this, we need to understand the forces that control suction pressure. What is causing this to occur? Now, when we have low suction pressure, it is very, very easy to assume that there's not enough refrigerant in the system. There's low on refrigerant equals low pressure. That's the assumption. Let's challenge that for a minute. Can you think, can you think of any case where the quantity of refrigerant in something does not affect its pressure? I can. I can think of a refrigerant cylinder. And you can easily check this yourselves. In your organization, I'm sure you have some refrigerant cylinders that are completely full, some that are somewhat full, and some that are almost empty, but not entirely empty, right? If you put all those three cylinders together in the same environment and measure their pressure, they will all be the same. Interesting. Whenever there is saturated refrigerant, its pressure is dictated by the pressure and temperature chart. It's not dictated by how much refrigerant is in the thing. And that is a very important distinction to make. Truth be told, the amount of refrigerant that's in the air conditioning system, while it does play a role in what the pressure is, it is not nearly as important a role as most technicians assume. In fact, it is on the list of things that cause what the pressure to be, but it's way down at the bottom of the list. There are other things that cause the pressure to be what it is, primarily, way before the quantity of refrigerant does. And to just easily observe that, you can look at your refrigerant cylinders and verify, that. well, well by golly, as long as there's a saturated refrigerant in that cylinder, the pressure is going to be the same, no matter how much refrigerant it actually is, right? Anywhere in between full and empty, it will always have the same pressure. So there's going to have to be some other force at work that is causing that. Let's take a look and see what it is. The factors that influence suction pressure are. In order of importance, by the way, let me get my face out of the way. Most important, number one, the heat load to the evaporator coil. The heat load that is being delivered to the evaporator coil is what is the primary driving force behind deciding what the suction pressure will be. 
the moisture content of the air. This is known as the latent heat load. The moisture content of the air is a component of the overall heat load on the evaporator coil. So these two are one and two really, really close together. They're almost exactly the same thing. The third most important factor, the return air temperature. This is the sensible temperature that is measured on your thermometer. What is that temperature of air? Now, compared to the first two, the heat load in BTU and the moisture content, the latent heat load, the actual air temperature is not nearly as significant. It is a factor, but it's not as big of a factor. These four things, air flow rate across the evaporator, this is the other component that is related to heat load. The heat load on the evaporator coil, I guess we could divide up into three components, right? Let me come back to you guys here. There we go. The heat load on the evaporator coil is really three parts. It is the moisture content of the air, the latent load. It is the return air temperature, that's the sensible load. And it is the airflow rate across the evaporator, or the mass of airflow going across the evaporator, being driven by the blower and through the duct system. These three things create the overall heat load to the evaporator coil. Now, it is totally possible to have proper airflow and not have and have cold return air temperature and low moisture content. That would be a low load condition, low heat load to the evaporator coil. It's also very possible to have a high moisture content and high return air temperature, but a low airflow rate across the evaporator coil. That is also going to result in a low heat load, which is why I decided to separate these three things out into three separate things. But be aware, they're all tied together as a part of this overall big owl number one heat load of the evaporator coil factor or factor that influences suction pressure. So I would suggest that if we were to put these in order, this would be number one, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 1.3. The next factor that influences suction pressure is the head pressure. What is the head pressure? And all of the things that go into influencing head pressure, right? Such as the flow rate of air across the condensing coil, the temperature of the air across the condensing coil, the um, um, how dirty is the condensing coil or how clean is the condensing coil? What condition is the condenser fan in? Um, are there leaves built up around it? Is there a bag stuck to the side of the thing? Those things influence head pressure. So if these four things are 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1 1.3, head pressure, let's compare it to, it's not number two. <laughs> In fact, it's probably more down to number five or, or six. There's a big gap in importance of influence between the number one influence and the next one on the list. It's not second in line. There's a big gap of importance there. And I would put this down at about five or six. The next one is the action of the compressor. So the compressor, of course, is responsible for creating head pressure. And if the compressor has, uh, has failed, it's not going to be able to create head pressure and it's not going to be able to reduce suction pressure. Generally, though, when we have a compressor problem, the result is not lower than normal suction pressure. It's generally higher than normal suction pressure. Because of the failure of that compressor, it is still running. It is still developing some kind of a pressure difference, but not enough. So normally when we have a compressor problem, it does not contribute to low pressures. It contributes to higher than normal suction pressures. There we go. Next is, and I would put the action of the compressor down around maybe, if the head pressure was number six, I'd put um, the action of the compressor down around number eight. Next is the action of the metering device. Now, metering devices can be a factor in determining what the suction pressure is, but they certainly can't do it all by themselves. They have to have all these other things that are kind of combining together to create that head or suction pressure. But what the metering device can do is if the metering device is too small, if it's a thermostatic expansion valve that refuses to open correctly, 
or if there is something stuck or clogged in the metering device or in the strainer leading up to the metering device or in the liquid line filter dryer that's immediately before the metering device, that's going to create more of a restriction than is intended. And as a result, in those cases, the suction pressure is going to be lower than normal. And we'll come back to that one in just a second. Put a pin in that. So I would put this one here at action of the metering device at number nine in importance. And lastly, we have the quantity of refrigerant in the system. The quantity of the refrigerant in the system. The quantity of refrigerant in the system is a factor that influences the suction pressure. And if you have way not enough refrigerant in the system, it's going to give you way not enough suction pressure, right? That is going to influence suction pressure. But not in the way that you might necessarily think. And so we're going to put the quantity of refrigerant in the system way down here at number 10. Okay. In fact, I would be so bold as to say that if everything else in the system was working 100% perfectly, that it would be very, very difficult to cause a frozen coil only by reducing the quantity of refrigerant in the system. It would be very, very hard to do. In fact, I would love for you to try it. I've tried it, I can tell you, but I want you guys to do it. Go to one of your um, test units or your own unit at your own house and identify that everything's working perfectly and then start slowly removing refrigerant from it and see if you can get that coil to freeze under normal warm weather operating conditions. And I would bet you'll find that it is not easy to do. It's not just going to happen all by itself. And that in there is another clue that we should be following. Now, interestingly enough, these two last ones, number eight and number nine, the action of the metering device, which could be causing a lower than normal suction pressure, and the inadequate quantity of refrigerant in the system, which could be causing a lower than normal suction pressure, they are both basically the same thing when, as far as the evaporator is concerned. Both cases result in not enough refrigerant being in the evaporator coil. Now, we have had discussions before about which one of the four major components of the air conditioning system is the most important? I'm kind of going off a little tangent here. I'll come back to it. Don't worry. Which one of the system components in the system is the most important? And the four major components are compressor, condenser, metering device, and evaporator. These are the four major components of every vapor compression refrigeration system. And air conditioners fall into that category. Which one of those is the most important? And I put the answer at the evaporator. The reason why I say the evaporator is the most important is because that is the one that is responsible for doing all the cooling, <laughs> for absorbing the heat. That is the most important part. That is where the magic happens. The other three components are just there to support that goal that the evaporator has, right? So the evaporator is the thing that's responsible for doing the cooling, for absorbing the heat. And... Here's the amazing, amazing thing. If there's not enough refrigerant in the evaporator coil, can it absorb enough heat? Well, of course not. No. The evaporator is not able to do its very important job. Okay. So I'm going to tie this all up together in an, a nice little bow. And this part here was uh, not my invention. This was taught to me when I was first starting out by a very excellent trainer who worked at one of our uh, wholesalers that we would go to sometimes for training. And he said it this way. He says, think about this. What is the stuff in the air conditioning system that makes it get cold? What is that stuff? Well, the stuff, of course, is refrigerant, right? That is the stuff that makes it get cold. That's the stuff that gets cold. Okay, great. So explain to me this is, this is his words now, explain to me how less of the stuff that makes it get cold is going to have the effect of making it get colder. How can we have not enough refrigerant make it get colder to the point where it is absorbing more heat than it should be. Because remember, when we are cooling, 
We are moving heat from one place to another. And when that evaporator coil freezes, it is colder. It is removing more heat than it's supposed to be. Wow, that is, that is a thought, isn't it? Absolutely it is. And here's what's going on. Here's why that's so important. When we have a air conditioning coil freezing over, there is refrigerant in there able to absorb heat, and it does. And where does it absorb it from? It absorbs it back from the refrigerant, causing it to get even colder. And this is what can lead to the freezing coil. If we do not have enough refrigerant in there, we are not going to have nearly as strong of a refrigeration effect. And in fact, the temperature of the vapor leaving that coil is going to be nowhere near freezing. In fact, it's going to be higher and higher and higher. The less refrigerant we have in the evaporator coil, the higher our refrigerant temperatures are going out because the action of the air and the heat in that air serves to increase the temperature of that refrigerant, not decrease it. There is the crucial evidence that there's more to it than the quantity of refrigerant in the system. In the event that you do have a slow leak, as refrigerant is leaking out of the system, you're going to reach this unique critical point where there is still enough liquid refrigerant hitting the metering device to create refrigeration effect. Um, but still not enough, in, uh, enough of a loss, I should say, to create a lower uh, suction pressure. And you could be hovering around in that near freezing temperatures. And as a result, because we're not cooling enough and it's warm outside, it runs long enough to start to build a band of frost across the evaporator coil. And then that then is going to lead to a cascading failure. But those instances are not as common. It can happen, but it's not as common. Okay, and I'll show you how to figure that out here in just a minute. Let me back up for a second here. Okay, so if a starved metering device and quantity of refrigerant in the system, which also starves the evaporator coil, are not the main causes of, um, of frozen coils, what is? The main cause of frozen evaporator coils is this, inadequate heat load on the evaporator coil. The number one cause of that is inadequate airflow rate across the evaporator coil. We're not bringing enough BTUs to the refrigerant in the evaporator coil. And as a result, the boiling process of that refrigerant slows down. And instead of being a big powerful rolling boil that blooms and has vapor expanding in the evaporator coil. There's that word again, expansion, right? Direct expansion coil, thermostatic expansion valve. Refrigerant expands in the evaporator coil. Well, when that process slows down, that expansion doesn't happen as much. And as a result, the suction pressure is not as high. Suction pressure falls. And as suction pressure falls, so does temperature. And there's not enough heat there to properly boil that refrigerant, and that's what causes its temperature to fall. You can almost think about the um, airflow across the evaporator as keeping the evaporator warm, keeping it above freezing, and that's exactly what happens. If we don't have a, a, a airflow across the evaporator, we go below freezing very, very easily and very, very quickly. And that is the number one cause. Now, I'm not going to say that you can't have low airflow across the evaporator and a loss of refrigerant. That's actually pretty common. Very common that we do not have good airflow through our duct system because of inadequate duct building, inadequate duct design, and inadequate duct installation. Now, we can probably install a system that's going to work halfway decent, but then when we combine a little bit of inadequate refrigerant to the system, system it can't handle it anymore. And there's, it will then create the freezing system. That's why when people then go in and they add some refrigerant to it and it doesn't freeze anymore, they think they solved it. Hmm. That was a symptom, but not the main cause. Okay. So imagine now, what do we do? Imagine that we have gone to a customer's house and we've identified that coil is frozen. How do we identify that? Well, we go back, boom, we see one of those. Boom, we see one of those. You've got a frozen coil. What can we do? Step one, 
defrost the coil completely, inside and out. Now, your outside is going to defrost a lot faster than your inside. So don't be fooled in thinking that your ice has gone off of your suction line and your compressor that now your evaporator is clear too. No. In fact, all of the ice must be completely melted away. Every little scrap of it has to be gone. Now, this can create problems. The best and safest way to do this is to turn the fan switch at the thermostat to fan on, which is going to just allow air to blow, and then pull the disconnect out at the outdoor unit. If you're working on a package unit, obviously you can't do both of those things at the same time. You can only do that on a split system. On a package unit, you'll just uh, you know turn the fan on, but what you want to do is is try to prevent the customer from being able to engage the compressor. So what you may want to do on your package unit is um, um, pull the, disconnect the Y wire is one thing you can do. Um, or uh, disconnect the low voltage wires from the contactor. Just something to prevent that compressor from turning on. What we want to do is to stop the refrigeration action and allow defrosting to occur. And that's just going to take time. I mean, it's going to take hours. Um, we want the unit to defrost slowly. We want that melt water to drain away naturally. If we use an artificial heat source, such as we turn the heat on, <laughs> we can do that. Um, or if it's a heat pump, put it in defrost mode or in, put it into heat mode so that it'll, the uh, hot gas will defrost the um, evaporator coil. Um, those are both dangerous because it causes the ice to melt really, really quickly. And oftentimes the ice will fall off in chunks and it will land in places where we don't want it. Um, in, the, in, the, in the event that we have an upflow furnace with evaporator coil, if that ice falls down, it can fall into the spinning fan wheel and destroy it. <laughs> That's a bad thing. Um, or it'll, it'll tip over and it'll start melting out of the pan and it'll run all the way down the inside of the electronics and the cabinet. It'll get in the motor. If it's variable speed, it can take the motor out. Um, it can, if we're in an attic space or if we have a rooftop unit, it can melt down into the duct and then leak out from there and get into the ceiling and get into, oh, lots of bad things can happen. You want to avoid all that. Either way, when you're going to have to defrost a system, make sure the drain is clear and unobstructed. Blow that buck, blow that sucker out, so that we don't overflow and create a wet water hazard, water problem. Ideally, I'd like to have you reschedule for the next day if possible. I mean that that way you're just going to be sure that you're not wasting time, wasting trips, waiting around for this thing to defrost. And that's the big challenge that most folks have when they try to tackle this situation is they try to tackle it before the thing has completely defrosted. I guarantee you this, you cannot tell anything about how a system is running or about how much refrigerant has in it if there's still ice in the evaporator coil. It's just not possible. And people run into trouble. And that's what the guy I told you about in the beginning. That's what mistake he made. He didn't notice that there was ice on the evaporator coil because it was hard to get to. It was literally 20 feet up in the air uh, in a ceiling area. He didn't notice that had ice on the evaporator coil. And it didn't have any out at the suction line. It's a rare occurrence, but sometimes that can happen. And uh, as a result, um, ended up not recognizing that that was the problem. So um, reschedule for the next day if you can. If not, I mean, if it's an emergency, if it's a critical kind of application, you should have to wait. <laughs> now, you can speed up the defrost process sometimes. But if you're going to do that, if you're going to run the fan, uh, you run the furnace, if you're going to pull a heat gun out or a torch or something to try to melt this ice faster, you need to be there. You can't just turn it on and go have lunch and come back later. You need to, you need to babysit it and uh, make sure that the water doesn't go where it's not supposed to. Make sure that giant blocks of ice don't fall into the fan or where they're not supposed to go. You've got to babysit it. Um, otherwise, just let the fan run and let it still. If you don't let the fan run that block of ice can literally sit there for days and days and days because it's in a nice insulated little compartment <laughs> and there's nothing there to warm it up. It could take a long, long time. If your customer calls in on the phone and says, hey, I see ice on my air conditioner, what should I do? Uh, I would ask them to switch the thermostat to off, switch the fan to fan on, and schedule the appointment for the following day. 
There's no way to fix anything if there's ice built up. And it's just going to be a wasted trip for you and for them as well. Now, that's a decision that you guys can make. There may be an advantage for you to want to be the one to go out there and switch the thermostat off and the fan on. Um, but either way, there's nothing you can do when there's ice on the system. Nothing you can do at all. Now that you've identified that all of the ice is melted away, and it, now it's safe to start uh, troubleshooting, and you can even start doing this while the thing is in defrost mode, is look for obvious airflow restrictions. The airflow restriction is by far and away the most common cause of a frozen evaporator coil. Things like a dirty air filter, dirty evaporator coil, dirty secondary heat exchanger, now, checking for a dirty secondary heat exchanger is not easy <laughs> because the dirty secondary heat exchanger lives above the blower motor, where the blower motor blows up the first thing that it blows through on a high efficiency 90 plus AFUE gas furnace is the secondary heat exchanger. And that can be a good dirt catcher. You may have a system where somebody has come through and cleaned the fan wheel and they got a clean filter in there and a new evaporator coil, maybe even on a new fur a new AC install with an old furnace, but that if that secondary heat exchanger could be completely covered in fuzz, causing the inadequate airflow. That is a tricky one. Look for a malfunctioning blower, including variable speed fans that have not been set up correctly. It's not hard to make that mistake. Um, it can even be because thermostat, the Y wire is landed on um, Y1 instead of Y2. That's going to cause that fan to go at about 60% speed. That can lead to frozen evaporator coils all by itself. And that's a really good thing to look for if you're, having, if you're looking at a brand new installation. Okay, It could just be a simple error in setup or commissioning or setting the dip switches. It's a very easy thing to forget, very easy thing to do wrong because it's dark. It's at the end of the day. The switches are itsy-bitsy, tiny little things. Um, so check for those. If you have a flex duct system, check to see if you've got bad flex ducting. you got crushed ducts. You know, you're supposed to have this nice gentle sweep of any bends, but if it's... <laughs> it's going to restrict airflow, uh, especially on the return side. Uh, we're also talking about overall duct system sizing and design. Um, if we have ducts that are insulated on the inside, some of that duct liner can come loose and flap in, uh, block off the airflow or partially block off the airflow. So look for that. Also look for closed supply air registers. So one thing that a lot of folks love to do is they're like, hey, my bedroom upstairs isn't cooling well enough. Therefore, I'm going to take and I'm going to close off a bunch of the other registers in my house, like in the basement and on the first floor to try to divert more air upstairs. And that never works. <laughs> what it ends up doing is causes less overall air flow through the system and ultimately freezing a coil. And then we need to look into, again, maybe adding some returns into those lower areas to pick that cool air up and, re and direct it more throughout the house. Look at continuous fan operation. Uh, continuous fan operation, of course, is enhanced with a variable speed fan, which might lead you to new equipment sale and things like that. So these are some of the obvious airflow restrictions. Here's some good examples, right? Here's your dirty air filter. Whew. Yeah. Dirty evaporator coil. I mean, look at that thing. That thing is a carpet versus a uh, free-flowing coil. And these guys, these filtrate air filters, these are sometimes referred to as HEPA filters. They're sometimes referred to as high-efficiency air filters. And these are sold in all of the big-box hardware-type stores. And they're very restrictive to airflow. You start off with a system that has a marginal duct system in the first place, and then you add one of these air filters to it, it's really going to restrict airflow. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I've seen happen is a customer is a not in a position to redesign their system. They just can't. And um, 
what they'll do instead is they'll use little fiberglass filters like the little throwaways like this one in the summertime so as to minimize any restriction on their duct system and just kind of try to scrape by. But as long as they know that's what's going on, they're just scraping by, it's not correct, it's fine. Uh, but yeah, these guys are um, definitely not a good solution. However, when you see one of these things, um, avoid the temptation that I've seen some folks have to say, oh, these homeowners don't understand, they... They're putting these filters in, that's a bad idea. Recognize instead that when someone has gone out and invested in one of these, they did it for a reason, right? Look what this says on here. Ultra allergen, healthy living. Here's a little little girl with her dog. Um, there's a reason why people have are looking for these. It's because they're looking for a solution to a problem that they have. They feel that they have a problem with too many allergens in their air. They may have asthma, they may have allergies, they may have respiratory disorders, and they're looking for a treatment plan for that. And this is the best thing that they know of. So you guys can take a look at that and go, uh, hey, this is an opportunity to discuss proper filtration, proper air cleaning, air sanitization, and things like that. So remember that. These aren't the best solutions, but they're better solutions that we have, have available. Next, once you're clear <laughs> of ice, once you're sure that you have no more ice and your obvious sources of airflow restrictions are clear, start the unit up, put your gauges on it, get your thermometers out, and do a refrigeration system analysis. Pay very special attention to your superheat, your subcool, and your temperature drop. Now, your superheat and subcooler, uh, especially your subcooler, are going to be really good examples of whether or not you have enough refrigerant in the system, right? And your temperature drop is going to be an indication of your airflow. Remember, the common causes of a frozen coil is a lack of airflow. Other causes are secondary. Airflow is king. When you have an airflow problem, you will see a higher than normal delta T. Here again. If the cause were not enough refrigerant, why would it be making the air even colder? <laughs> that is an airflow problem, not a refrigerant problem. If your delta T is too high, you have an airflow problem. So how do you know what your delta T is supposed to be? Well, you're going to have to have a psychrometer. You're going to have to use this chart, which is in your handouts. I've got my psychrometer right here. I had it sitting on my desk as I've been talking here. And it is currently telling me that the relative humidity is about 50% right here. Therefore, my air conditioner should be supplying me a 19 degree temperature difference. If I had an airflow problem that was the cause of my frozen coil, I would see a greater than 19 degree temperature difference. And this is the temperature difference between the return air and the supply air. If I measure my return air at 78 and I measure my supply air at um, 59, that's a 19 degree temperature difference. Make sure I check the math, do the math right on that. <laughs> but that's the idea. You subtract the higher number of the return air from the lower number of the supply air, and the difference is your temperature drop or temperature difference, or temperature delta T. So I should have a 19 degree delta T. If instead I have a 23 degree delta T, or a 22 degree delta T, or even a 27 degree delta T, I have inadequate airflow across the evaporator coil, period. No arguing. That's what it is. If, instead of having a 19 degree delta T, I have a 16 degree delta T, or a 15 degree delta T, or 14 or 12, I do not have enough refrigeration power happening. I'm not refrigerating enough. There's not enough refrigerant in my evaporator coil. I may be completely low on refrigerant or have a clogged metering device or something like that. That is the importance of knowing how to check your temperature drop and realizing that it depends on what your relative humidity is as measured with your psychrometer. It depends on what your relative humidity is. If, I'm, if, I, if it's a good, have really you know, humid day, 
If it's 70% relative humidity, it just rained or something, yeah, I should have 15 degree delta T. If it's real dry, like down here, well, here where I live, sometimes we get real dry down in the 20% range. And then having a 26 degree delta T is normal under those conditions. So your temperature difference through the evaporator coil is going to change based upon the operating conditions and the relative humidity. The other thing that changes it is, look here, airflow, 400 CFM per ton of cooling. It's not really easy to immediately measure airflow, but it is real easy to measure relative humidity and no, it is also easy to measure return and supply air temperatures. And so between those three measurements, you can identify if you have correct airflow, inadequate airflow, or inadequate refrigeration happening. So this chart is really, really, really handy, and you should have this with you at all times. Next solution. So you've identified you have low airflow. Next, we want to move on to some duct sizing and duct rebuild. And a lot of times, of course, we're looking at an older system. Uh, we may want to incorporate that into a complete new system installation. So duct sizing and rebuild. One thing that we can sometimes do is if we notice that um, we are not, we're, our, our main blower is starved for return air, which is probably one of the more common situations, is can we add any return air openings? Can we add a larger return air duct? Can we add an additional return air duct? In homes that have basements with um, especially finished basements where the uh, furnace is kind of in its own little room by itself, very frequently it's easy for us to tap an additional uh, 10 or 12 inch duct right through that wall uh, from the return side, through that wall into that cool basement space and then pick up that air from the basement and then flow it through the rest of the house and that can do go a long ways toward restoring our airflow and oftentimes it can help that upstairs bedroom get the airflow that it needs there's a lot more two duct solutions and that's a little beyond the scope of this class but i want to mention this is another place to go to find permanent solutions to freezing coil problems next now, the, now we're going to start getting a little tricky, okay? If the system is equipped with a piston-type orifice, a fixed metering device is another word for that, replace it with a thermostatic expansion valve. Now, just straight up replacing a thermostatic expansion valve on a residential air conditioning system is a pretty big job. And if it's not brand new and still under warranty, probably not going to happen. But you should know that the thermostatic expansion valve's job is to regulate the amount of refrigerant in the evaporator coil in accordance with the heat load on the evaporator. And we've already discussed that the reason why coils freeze is because there's more refrigerant than there is heat to evaporate it. And if we had a thermostatic expansion valve to literally restrict the amount of refrigerant going into the evaporator under low load conditions, it will be less likely to freeze. And that is, in fact, the truth. Air conditioning systems that are equipped with TXVs are less likely to freeze under low load conditions. They will continue operating for a longer time. They will cool better and fail to freeze up under low load conditions. It's a miracle, but it happens. Next solution, add a freeze stat. This is probably the cheapest, fastest, and easiest thing to do. If you have a customer who has a chronic airflow problem, um, they don't have enough duct system, and they want to have their set point real low, because remember, the cooler that return air is, the more likely it's going to be to freeze, especially in a low airflow situation, add a freeze stat. A free stat is a normally closed, close on rise temperature actuate, actuated switch. And it's got this little kind of curve to it, a little spring, and it's supposed to clamp on to the U bend at the end of an evaporator coil. Um, now, this is not actually an evaporator coil, but it gives you the same, it's a, just a good picture of it to show how this guy is going to clamp onto that U bend. As the coil temperature falls, below a set point, and I believe the set point is around 34, 35 degrees. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 20 degrees on this guy. 
uh, as the uh, saturated suction temperature falls to about 20 degrees, the free stat will open. And we wire this in series with the Y wire that goes to the condensing unit. So when this switch opens, what happens is the contactor for the condensing coil opens and the outdoor unit stops running. But there's still a demand for cooling from the thermostat. So the fan keeps going. And it allows the freezing action to stop because we've stopped the compressor, allows the fan to continue blowing across the evaporator coil, which warms it back up again, causes our suction pressure to go back up to normal. And then once the temperature sensed by the uh, freestat goes back to a normal temperature, it'll close again and it'll turn the condensing unit back on. Essentially what we're doing here is we are co controlling the cooling capacity. Because remember, when we're having a freezing situation, what we have is we have more cooling power in the evaporator than we have heat to evaporate it, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to modulate that capacity by turning the compressor off for a part of time and then turning it back on again. As a result, now our compressor is cycling off and on, which it's probably not going to be most happy about, but it is a middle-of-the-road solution to stop the freezing problem. And when we have a freezing problem, of course, we have no cooling, right, because we can't flow any air through a block of ice um, and allow that unit to continue cooling and to get through those low-load freezing condition problems. So freeze stats are cheap, easy ways to solve a uh, chronic uh, evaporator coil freezing problem when we're not able to rebuild the duct system or install a brand new system or, or do any of those kinds of fixes. It's a Band-Aid. And be aware, yeah, it's a Band-Aid. But hey, sometimes a Band-Aid is what you need. Next solution, and this one totally blows my mind that it works, but it does. Install a fan cycling low ambient control. When your freezing problem occurs primarily during mild weather, not in the heat of the season, but maybe in the spring, fall, uh, maybe we have a customer that just really likes cool temperatures year round and, and uh, they like to you know, have their AC running in the middle of winter sometimes if, it's, if you live in a colder climate. When it happens in mild weather, our head pressure is part of the culprit. Remember I said the head pressure was an influencing factor? Well, it is. And when we have uh, mild conditions, head pressure falls. And when head pressure falls, it causes a corresponding drop in suction pressure. And that can cause the suction temperatures to dip below freezing and lead to a frozen coil. The fan cycling control is a normally open, open on rise, pressure activated switch and it's wired in series with the common wire on the condenser fan motor. You use an access T like this one. This is called an access T. It has a, a refrigeration female fitting on one side, and you're going to screw this onto the liquid line gauge port. So now it branches that liquid line gauge port into two directions. This one is going to be the new gauge port, and this one is where you're going to screw on the pressure switch to cycle the fan. The way it runs is in cold weather, the head pressure is going to fall. And when it falls below the set point of the fan cycling control, the condenser fan switches off. While the condenser fan is off, the head pressure begins to rise again. When it rises to the point of the set point of the pressure switch, the switch is pushed closed, it energizes the fan, and the fan runs, which causes the pressure to fall again. When it falls so far, the switch will open and the fan will shut off. This is why it's called a fan cycling control, because it cycles the fan on and off. The cool thing about this is in cold weather, the condenser fan motor stays off while the compressor runs, building head pressure, and then turns the fan on. Uh, this helps... Uh, the, the leading thing, here's the amazing thing about this. When the head pressure suddenly falls, when the fan turns on, the amazing thing is that it falls so fast that some of the liquid refrigerant flashes into vapor. And it literally sends uncondensed vapor through the evaporator coil, which has a secondary effect of reducing the refrigeration effect and also sending warmer gas through the evaporator coil to tend to defrost it. It's a miracle. It's amazing. It's really cool. 
and it works really, really well. This produces somewhat better results than the free stat for mild weather conditions because it doesn't cycle the compressor off and on. The compressor keeps on trucking the whole time, which it's going to be pretty happy about. A bit more complicated than a free stat, a bit more wiring involved, a bit more time. Um, but again, if you're having this issue, it only happens in mild weather, this would be a good solution for that. All right, folks, so that is our discussion on how to handle frozen evaporator coils, as well as hopefully a little bit of understanding about what causes them to happen, which leads you to the proper solution, right? Remember, the primary cause of a frozen evaporator coil is inadequate heat load, and the most common cause of inadequate heat load is inadequate airflow. All right, folks, have yourselves a great rest of the day and a great rest of the week, and look forward to seeing you again real soon.